In this lesson, we're going to learn about some methods that are extremely common to see um, when modeling biological systems. And there's some good reasons for that. And it comes down to the fact that when we make biological measurements, we often find that things are really correlated with one another. And so having some special methods to be able to deal with that is going to be really important. And so we're going to talk about two methods that uh, allow us to make predictions and are really widely used for situations such as this, where we um, have a variety of inputs, so things that we can change about uh, the, the behavior of cells or things that will change the behavior of cells. We might measure a whole bunch of details about how cells are making particular decisions, and then we measure their response. And what we end up wanting to do is take these signals um, that we measured and ask, well, how are they related to the response of cells? And due to um, the way that biological signaling generally works, one property of these measurements is that uh, the signals that we measure are often really highly correlated with one another. Um, and so let's think about the, the challenges that we have here, and then we can start to develop some of these methods. So first of all, if we wanted to predict how some cells responded to, um, uh, based on a measurement that we make, that problem isn't difficult. That's something that we've already seen already. If we had some input measurements, maybe we call this X, and we had some output measurement of cell response, <clears throat> we could use something simply like ordinary least squares regression, some sort of nonlinear regression. We have a whole bunch of tools in our toolbox now for dealing with problems like this. And we might see that a low input signal is correlated with a low response and vice versa. And that would allow us to build a model that could predict this response based on any sort of input. But one of the challenges um, with biological systems is often <clears throat> we need to take into account multiple different inputs to be able to make some sort of prediction. So this is an example of this, where if we looked in one um, cell situation, we might say, OK, there's a positive relationship with this signal, phosphojunk. If we look in another situation, we might find that there's a negative relationship. And if we looked in yet another, we might see that there's a more complicated relationship. And what this shows is we often need multiple different measurements in order to make accurate predictions of how cells behave. So we're going to have to make lots of different measurements. Um, and that's going to be a property of us building uh, these kinds of models. So both of the methods that we're going to see today are supervised learning methods, meaning that they're predicting some sort of output response. Um, but at the same time, they're going to be pretty different than the, the supervised methods we've seen so far. And one of the big differences that's going to be kind of unique um, is that these are also going to be factorization methods. So remember, so far we've had factorization as a data reduction method. Um, and then we've also separately had these supervised methods that are able to predict some output response. Here, we're going to combine those two ideas to be able to get um, models that have really nice but pretty unique properties. Another thing just um, that we'll see a little bit of, but you'll see especially if you dig through the literature, is that the ideas um, from this lesson have been rediscovered in a variety of different areas, including in chemistry, economics, and in statistics. And in each of those areas, they've ended up with slightly different notation um, and uh, mathematical descriptions. And so it can be a little bit of challenging to look through the literature on these methods because of this. Um, but we'll try to go through with a fairly consistent uh, notation for everything here. Another minor thing that we need to add, um, and you've essentially already seen this uh, before, but I just want to make sure that this isn't a surprise, <clears throat> is that um, potentially we might want to predict multiple output things. So for example, let's say we have a common data set. Notice that we have shared x1 
and X2 here. Um, in biology, we often might want to predict, say, both whether or not cells grow and whether or not cells die. These would be two separate predictions. <clears throat> and so in order to do that, what we would do is we'd have separate weights for each of those predictions. So we'd have the same input values, but we'd weight them a little bit differently to get different predictions. Um, <coughs> We already have all the tools to do this. This would be called multilinear regression, um, but it's really just ordinary least squares in some sort of matrix notation. So instead of having y equals um, the, the input data times a single set of weights, so a beta vector, <clears throat> we're gonna have a B uh, matrix, and that matrix means that we're going to allow for multiple outputs here. Um, and solving this is just exactly the same as with ordinary least squares, um, except we're going to do it in a fully matrix form rather than ending up with a vector at the end here. So again, we can do um, ordinary least squares regression for multiple outputs, and the only difference is going to be that this is going to end up in this matrix form. Okay, so this is a bit of a review, but another challenge we're going to have with biological systems is often it's really difficult for us to make measurements, but we can measure lots of different things. Um, and remember, we started with this situation where we have um, more observations than measurements. And in this case, we don't have an exact solution, but we can use something like ordinary least squares. With m equal to n, we can perfectly fit the data, but we have a unique solution. But often we're sitting in a situation where we have more measurements than observations. And so there's an infinite set of different models that would perfectly fit the data, but again, they wouldn't be predictive. And so we're gonna need um, some form of regularization in order to reduce down our data so that we're able to build a model and we're able to predict things reliably. Um, and we've seen regularization, we've seen lasso and ridge regression. Um, and I mentioned that there's an infinite number of different ways that you could perform regularization. It's just a process of introducing bias to reduce variance in the models that you end up with. Um, and all of those would be perfectly fine. Today, we're gonna to make an a, a assumption that when we look at our data, the measurements or the values that vary more are gonna be more meaningful. And therefore, we're gonna assume that if we have some sort of tiny change in our data, like a 1% change in some measurement, that that's gonna be less important. And um, this is a choice, you know, uh, just like with lasso or with ridge regression, this is a choice in exactly what we ended up throwing out in our model. And so whether or not this is correct is really going to depend on the type of data you have. If you have data where the larger variation is the more meaningful variation, then these are going to be good methods. If you have data where most of the measurements don't matter at all, and you're just picking out that one measurement that does predict your output value, then you're probably going to want to go with something like lasso, because that's exactly what lasso um, regularizes for. Okay, so the, the first method we're going to talk about is pretty simple, given the tools you've already learned about. Um, one thing I mentioned with principal components analysis, and again, this is a method that is going to reduce down your data by looking for the maximum directions of variation. So for example, on this graph, we find this first direction of variation, and we turn this into a principal components component. And then we, after that, would find a second direction of variation. And these directions of variation explain the maximum variation in the data set. Um, for principal components regression, we're simply going to reduce down our data by PCA and then perform multilinear regression in order to link our principal components to our output. So instead of having a model where we have uh, in our regression model where we have weights that are our individual variables. Instead, we're gonna have weights for how important each of our principal components are for predicting an output. 
So the, the way this looks in math form is uh, we take our X or our input data um, and we reduce this down by principal components analysis and we'll end up with uh, then a scores and a loadings matrix. And then when it comes time to perform our prediction, we'll perform not uh, ordinary least squares or multilinear regression in order to predict our Y output. And really importantly, um, keep in mind that your regression is using the scores matrix of principal components. Um, so the loadings, again, are going to tell you how the variables are related to each other. The scores tell you about how the observations are related to each other. And when you perform regression, what you want to have is your input observations, and you're saying how those are related to the output observations. So remember that the regression part of principal components regression is always going to use the scores matrix for training. But again, the loadings matrix is going to tell us about how the variables are related to the results that we get. Uh, so how do we interpret this in the end? Um, the, the way that we're really going to think about how, what our principal components regression model is telling us is not looking at the scores matrix. We'll go back to that loadings matrix. So what I've envisioned here is, let's say we build a model where we have um, four inputs. We have height, weight, blood pressure, and BMI. And we're going to predict whether or not someone has heart disease. <clears throat> so the first step we're going to perform is principal components analysis. This doesn't use your output at all. So um, we're going to ignore heart disease, the measurements for now. Um, but we'll perform principal components regression or principal components analysis on height, weight, blood pressure, and BMI. <clears throat> and so I set up what that might look like. We might end up with a principal component uh, one that looks like something like this, where, you know, this is really possibly the effect of height, uh, where we see that taller people tend to weigh a little bit more. The effect of height uh, doesn't affect blood pressure, and so we see blood pressure just at zero or loaded at zero on principal component one. Um, and then maybe tall people tend to have a slightly lower BMI. <clears throat> And so BMI ends up negatively on principal component one. And then um, again, if we're, we're just interpreting the principal components analysis here. So we're seeing patterns in the data and we're saying, okay, what, those, what might those be? This second principal component may actually relate to um, the, the weight of people. So um, if principal component one is really holding height constant, then we see that as people gain weight, in a way that isn't related to their height, um, that they maybe tend to have a higher blood pressure, they tend to have a higher BMI, um, and so we end up with this principal component two that's explaining this pattern in the data. And so again, these uh, different variables were all highly correlated with each other from before, but the principal component analysis is gonna move these into principal component dimensions where we've accounted for these patterns rather than um, the individual variables themselves. Okay, so we've got our principal components analysis set up. Now we're going to perform our ordinary least squares regression. And again, we're gonna do that on the scores matrix. So the, the matrix that tells us how all the patients are related to each other. And we'll end up with weights um, from that that relate to the individual principal components. So beta one in our regression is gonna end up being related to principal component one, and beta two is gonna be related to principal component two. And so we can look at our beta terms from our um, final regression, and we can see that um, beta two is more highly weighted in order to predict heart disease. And so the way to interpret that would be principal component two is um, has a positive relationship with heart disease. And so people who are predicted to have heart disease are going to 
have correspondingly higher EMIs, higher blood pressure, and higher weight. Uh, because rather than building a regression model on each individual measurement, again, we're doing a regression model on each individual principal component or the patterns in those data. So with that, that's really everything there is to principal components regression. Rather than performing regression on the original data set, we perform regression on the scores matrix of the principal components analysis. And to whatever extent our PCA analysis is capturing real patterns in the data, it's going to reduce down the data and provide us a more reliable result through regularization. One open question may be, you know, um, in general, we may not know how many principal components we need um, to accurately reduce down our data. Now, this was a problem with PCA analysis because that's a hard question to answer. PCA doesn't have a really a way of telling us how many components or how many patterns are present in our data. But remember, we're using a supervised method. So what we care about in this case is prediction. And so um, one way we can answer this question is we can build models with varying numbers of components. And then we can look at the cross-validation error. Um, and in fact, uh, this has a name generally in engineering. So remember, we had this R2x quantity, which was the, the um, fidelity of reconstruction. Um, when we decomposed our data and then reconstructed it for um, principal components analysis. With these supervised methods, one quantity we can look at is Q2y. Um, and what this is, is it's the fidelity and reconstruction of y on cross-validation. So if we take our y um, and we subtract it from our predicted y, and we ask what the variance of this is, and then divide it by the variance of the y that we started with and take one minus this, um, what we can see is if our um, predicted y is perfect, then the top here is gonna end up be zero. This will have some value. And so we'll end up with a q2y equal to one. Um, if our predicted y is terrible, then maybe we end up with the same amount of variance on the top and the bottom of this fraction. And so then we'll end up with a Q2y of zero. So the Q2y works very much like R2x in that um, higher values are better. It's going to maximize at one. And actually it can end up less than zero. And what that would indicate is that your prediction is actually worse than maybe just taking the average of y and predicting a constant value across all of your patients. Unlike R2x, Q2y is generally going to come to some maximum and then start to get worse. And so what this indicates is adding principal components up to the maximum value is improving the ability of your model to predict its output. And then as you're adding additional components past this, you're making your model worse. And so unlike R2x, which is always going to increase, Q2y in general is going to increase and then decrease. And the reason for this is Q2y is really related to the prediction error, while R2x is more related to the training error. Um, and so like we saw with the prediction error versus the fitting error, the fitting error always gets better as we go to more complicated models. The prediction error can get worse after you get past your, your optimal model. And with that, that's principal components regression. And um, next we'll talk about partial least squares regression.